Hi, my name is Matt Welch. I'm the editor-in-chief of Reason Magazine, the magazine for free minds and free markets. And I'm also the author of uh, McCain, The Myth of a Maverick, sort of an ideological portrait of Republican uh, presumptive uh, nominee John McCain. I am here today on Blogging Heads TV with National Review senior editor Ramesh Ponaru, and I'm sure I just mangled the pronunciation of your name, and Ramesh, I am sorry that we did that. Today we're here to talk about John McCain and the upcoming election and what it means for conservatives, libertarians, Americans, and other people. And with that, Ramesh, I give the floor to you. Thanks. Um, actually, you, you did uh, you did pretty well. It's it's Panuru, but um, Mark Shields on CNN uh, called me Deepak Chopra once, so <laughs> it can uh, it can be worse. He did immediately catch himself and apologize. I should. Are you uh, are you that uh, outgoing as Deepak? Is the question. I, mean, uh, I, I think of, uh, that uh, if you averaged out our bank accounts, um, <laughs> well, it would probably uh, make me cry. But anyway. Let's talk about John McCain and your book, which is uh, uh, an interesting book. Um, if I uh, uh, remember correctly, you read a bunch of McCain's books because you found him a sort of appealing figure and then uh, decided that uh, some of the things he was revealing in those books weren't really getting covered or weren't really affecting the journalism about McCain. Could you go into that a little bit? Yeah, I mean, uh, in 2000, uh, you know, 1999, 2000, I, like, I don't know, 95% of uh, all national journalists uh, sort of briefly fell in love with McCain uh, for many of the same reasons why at the very same time the National Review was sort of falling in hate <laughs> with John McCain, which is that uh, he was kind of trashing on the Republican Party, and Lord knows we all like our politicians to have their sister soldier moments. Uh, he was calling, you know, Jerry Falwell and Pat Robertson agents of intolerance, and he seemed to be this figure after, you know, the kind of uh, weirdness of the Clinton era, who put his country uh, first and the uh, political party second, and that at the moment seemed like an attractive vision. So I would have voted for him if I had the chance. I was in California at the time, and I don't belong to a political party, so there really wasn't an opportunity for it. And so I took his books, uh, his two uh, main memoirs. Uh, uh, Faith of My Father's, uh, his Vietnam memoir, and Worth the Fighting For, uh, to a beach in Mexico, and just found them really fascinating, uh, really uh, attractive in some way. The same qualities that make him kind of endearing his candor, you know, um, that he's willing to uh, uh, talk about his uh, various affairs with strippers and chasing down uh, booze and broads and all that kind of stuff. It's very attractive and alluring. But the vision that he sort of reflected and basked in about what he thought about the proper role of government uh, struck me as underappreciated and from my uh, point of view as someone who kind of appreciates a limited government uh, kind of scary. Uh, and so from there I started reading more about him and reading more about kind of the ideological struggles of the late 1990s, which I hadn't really been all that aware of since I didn't live in the country. And I came up upon the sort of thesis that there are three main stages in McCain's life. Uh, speaking from an ideological perspective. The first is basically up until he got shot down, or up until he came back from uh, serving in the Hanoi Hilton, um, the first 35, 37 years of his life. He was a flyboy, he was a partier. If he had any ideology at all, it was the ideology of his family, which is the strong uh, sort of U.S. Navy benevolent empire of Teddy Roosevelt, uh, sort of under the thrall of Alfred Thayer Mahan, the great naval historian that, that argued uh, the 20th century America should basically take the place of 19th century Britain. But he didn't think about it much other than that. He just marinated that and lived in that. Then when he comes home, he becomes more of a Vietnam syndrome, Powell doctrine type of guy where, uh, and at default, a Reagan Republican. He was a, a close personal friend of Ronald Reagan uh, from 1973 onwards. And back then, in the first couple of decades of his political career, um, the ideologies that he cared about, there weren't very many, but chief among them was healing Vietnam, getting this Vietnam thing behind us, because he was traumatized by the divisions that that caused in the country at the time, and the way that it jeopard caused Americans to think that they lost faith in the in the in their uh, the rightness of their might, basically. Uh, and so he worked very hard at healing Vietnam, and he only had a couple of other stated interests in ideology. One, interestingly enough, uh, was that the executive branch needs more power vis-a-vis -vis Congress to wage war and foreign policy. 
uh, specifically. Uh, and, uh, and also he was a sort of a free trader, a default free trader, for which I uh, continue to applaud him for. Um, but that's basically was the extent of his politics for the most part up until this third phase of his life, 97, 98, 96, somewhere around there, uh, when he embraced this idea of national uh, greatness conservatism, which is a term coined by Weekly Standard, then Weekly Standard editors uh, Bill Crystal and David Brooks, that sought uh, a sort of to use the federal government as a way to sort of remoralize America at the time so that we all have great faith in the higher institutions of government, then we can get on with the business of being great. And that manifested itself in basically losing the uh, reticence that he had had about using American force. He went from being a guy who in 94 said, you know, having American boots on the ground in Bosnia is the worst thing that he could imagine in the world, to the guy in 99 who was the biggest single advocate for putting boots on the ground in Kosovo. And since then, he sort of reverted to this more Teddy Roosevelt-style ideology. And it also had many implications for domestic policy, which he suddenly took an interest in, the sort of great reform, you know, going after the malefactors of great wealth and so on. And I think uh, just because the context of the 2000 election is so different than our context now that we forget about that. It's, it, for, uh, for most Americans, I, I mean, uh, it was all about campaign finance reform, getting money out of politics, but people didn't really realize the extent to which he was the neoconservative choice against George W. Bush. Uh, he was making noises that should make, I think, some many conservatives and certainly libertarians uncomfortable about how we all need to, you know, uh, subsume ourselves under the higher power of kind of American national unity. Uh, I think, and I argue that that is uh, the McCain that we have to this day. And the question is, after eight years of George W. Bush, uh, is that what America needs now, or was it ever what America needed in 2000? And I uh, should emphasize again. That's some of the best writing about this and interesting thinking about this um, that I was able to draw from came from the National Review. It came from Rich Lowry uh, in 2000 and Jonah Goldberg, uh, people who, uh, you know, as Jonah put it, uh, national greatness is an agenda derived almost entirely from an increasingly incoherent cult of personality. Um, and uh, I would argue that there's some element of that to this day, which makes me feel kind of reticent about uh, John McCain. Although you could argue that uh, you know it's his bad luck to be running against somebody with an even bigger cult of personality than uh, than McCain had in 2000. This is uh, really true, and it's a, that's an interesting uh, point. I think is that uh, you know uh, when uh, Obama just gave this big speech at Wesleyan that everyone said was so terrific, uh, which I found uh, horrible. You could have uh, cut and pasted his sort of calls for service and you know and, uh, and subsuming yourself under the uh, higher power. Cut and pasted it from McCain's speech, even from this year or even from 2000, which is very uh, curious. Yeah, you know, and even the sort of changing politics um, part of his message is very much um, this type of thing that uh, that McCain was running on. Well, let me ask you this, R Ramesh. Uh, you uh, you came out uh, about the same time that I was writing, uh, you know, this uh, cover story about uh, be afraid of President McCain. You were writing an uh, interesting cover story yourself for the National Review, uh, making the case for John McCain uh, in a magazine that went on to endorse uh, Mitt Romney. Uh, a lot of your case was uh, prescient, I find, basically arguing that he would be the most likely candidate to win in a year that is looking really grim for Republicans. But other than his electability, what do you see as the conservative case for him? Well, I mean, I, th I think that, you know, if you look at issues from, uh, from as you mentioned, trade to opposition to tax increases to uh, gun control to Supreme Court, he's a conservative. I mean, he's been a very strong conservative over the years. And there are certainly issues where he has... Um, not been a conservative. Most of them are things that I frankly don't care about. Um, you know, things like drilling in Anwar. I mean, I think he's probably wrong on the issue. I don't think it would, it, you know, really have a huge impact either way. And uh, and uh, I can live with a, a presidential candidate who's wrong on that issue. Um, there are some, you know, there are some other areas of concern um, uh, that are that are more important. I mean, I think that um, the, the way he's chosen to fight. Global warming um, is uh, is wrong headed, and that's actually something. When I wrote my initial endorsement, I was more in the uh, my mood on that issue was a little bit more pro McCain, and that I was I was sort of annoyed with how many conservatives were simply denying that global warming existed, and so I was actually willing to to give him credit for being a little bit more 
uh, forward-looking than them. But um, but since then, I've, I've uh, been thinking about it more, and I think that the, the way you know the, the extremely heavy regulation um, that he wants to uh, deploy as a pro- problem is a, is a problem. Um, and it's one that I might uh, jump in that yeah. he will be able to enact as president uh, pretty easily, I think. With a Democratic uh, Congress who, uh, you know, shares a lot of his basic analysis, both of global warming and of the you know, necessity for cap and trade regulations or some kind of regulations. For yeah, well, it depends on how the Senate elections go. I mean, they're looking pretty grim for the Republicans right now. But uh, if the Republicans maintain filibuster power in the Senate, which probably means about 44, 45 Republicans uh, in the Senate in order to have the effective ability to, to call on 41 of them. Uh, to mount a filibuster, and that changes things. And the other thing that could change things is if over the next year, I mean, the, the way the campaign uh, develops in terms of the politics of energy, um, because I think you're already, I mean, you saw this week as people were debating um, the uh, the boxer warner Lieberman bill in the Senate, um, you saw a notable um, increase in fear among Democrats that maybe this isn't the best time to uh, to be having a big initiative that raises the price of energy. Right. But you mentioned earlier about uh, McCain sort of being a conservative on yeah. stuff like guns and abortion. I, he doesn't care about any of that, does he? I mean, the stuff that he cares about uh, is more, uh, you know, this year, this time around, yeah. the transcendent issue is a big foreign policy and uh, the sort of, you know, broad sense of... Uh, of uh, restoring uh, faith in America. In, in the stuff that he cares about, what makes him a conservative, if anything? Well, you know, uh, we should t- take a step back. I mean, I tend to have a pretty coolly transactional view of, uh, of politics, and, you know, I don't need my candidates really to care about the same things that I care about um, so long as I can count on those candidates to, uh, to you know, live up to the commitments um, in terms of the things that uh, 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 that McCain cares about, um, I think he cares a great deal about spending, um, cutting spending. Um, he cares a, a, a good deal about um, free trade. Uh, he cares about, uh, as you say, the foreign policy issues. Where you know, I think he's um, not. Uh, well, I mean, we may as well just get into this foreign policy debate. I mean, I think yes. Uh, I think that his vision on foreign policy is considerably more neoconservative, more gung-ho about um, the use of force to promote democracy abroad than I think is uh, is wise or prudent. Um, but he also, I mean, I think if you look at his cast of advisors, um, you can see the lingering influence of, uh, of the realism that he adhered to for most of his career. And I don't think that it's so bad to have a mix of realism and neoconservatism but in who's foreign the realist? policy. Who's well, the you know, people like Kissinger, people like, like hey, Peter Rodman. Kissinger is not close to him in any meaningful sense. I mean, he uh, puts him on a speed dial when he needs to try to make the case to the New York Times mm-hmm. that he's an Eisenhower Republican, which he seems to be very insistent on trying to uh, hit home. And I don't think that he is yeah. an Eisenhower Republican in any meaningful sense. I mean, the people around him who he talks to and who he takes sustenance from, I don't think there's a realist in that crowd. I mean, Randy Scheunemann is not a realist by any stretch of the imagination, and the people that McCain has been most in tune, attuned with over the last 10 years. I don't think it's been, a, it's, it hasn't been Brent Scowcroft, you know. Uh, even in these sort of articles in the New York Times and elsewhere that try to posit that he is, you know, that there's a war for McCain's yeah. foreign policy soil, uh, Soul, uh, you find that your Mark Salters, your Scheunemann says, you know what, there is no war. Uh, our side won. So I, I think it's kind of a lingering, uh, you know, desire for the media to believe well, that he's, you know, uh, that his heart is in the right place in some way. Keep in mind, though, that before 911, the chief neoconservative foreign policy enthusiasm, and this includes the period, you know, the, the last 10 years of McCain, 1999, 2000, 2001. Their chief enthusiasm was um, a hostility to China, and their big, the biggest sort of plank of their platform was to suspend normal trade relations with China. And McCain does not appear to have given that campaign a, sort of even a moment's thought, and it was just completely on the other side of it from day one. And the other thing is, and this is a sort of a trickier question, I've been actually thinking about this in the context of Obama this week, making his reversal on Middle East-related issues, particularly Iran, before APAC, you know, and whether he's actually going to have these unconditional talks. 
And, you know, I'm sort of not sure which Obama to believe because I just think actually being in the presidency tends to, to change these people. I mean, clearly it changed President Bush uh, along with September 11th. Um, I wonder how it would affect Obama. And I also think, you know, McCain, whatever sort of uh, ideas he might have as to sort of the global mission of the United States, there's going to be a fairly su- fairly tight capacity constraint. I well, would not think if he gets his president. Not if he gets his way. I mean, I, I agree with you that there's that presidents change once. I mean, everyone campaigns in a certain sense on a humble foreign ch- policy, and yet a, a certain toughness towards China and blah blah blah, and then they become the president, and, and lo and behold, you know, they discover uh, their history books, and they'll invoke the Munich appeasements at every opportunity. It just sort of happens that way, and they'll make their accommodation with China. But in almost every one of those cases, the starting point is one of sort of a, a comparative reluctance. To uh, to you know in, inflict themselves in the world, and it ends up being more interventionist as it goes on. In McCain's case, he's starting from that point of uh, sort of bellicosity or interventionism, or you know to put the, the most positive spin on it, possibly possible that you know he just thinks that there should be one benevolent kind of hegemon in the world, and that the world would be a much better place. That probably squares more with his beliefs than anything else. But uh, I don't think that the direction that that can go is to suddenly lessen what he believed going in because in almost every case, once a president gets in office, they look around and they say, you know, why, why do we have this you know, marvelous military that we keep uh, hearing so much about? And McCain is, you know, his platform is to, we need to increase the troop size by 150,000 troops. We need to spend much more on military, not just that, but uh, uh, spend a higher percentage of the world's total defense dollars, which I find is a very curious kind of attitude to have right now, and he wants to launch a new OSS, because apparently one CIA is not enough. So I think that he is going in with an idea of, let's build capacity uh, to help kind of uh, 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 fight the things that I want to fight as I go on, and let's use the bully pulpit to try to convince Americans of things. I mean, you read that Matt By profile in the New York Times Magazine. It was very interesting uh, talking about his foreign policy uh, where he asked McCain, like, hey, look, there's a great humanitarian reason to invade Iraq, so why not Zimbabwe and Burma? And McCain's answer was not, oh, well, that's not in our national interest. His answer was, well, unfortunately, it'd be pretty difficult right now to convince Americans of that. I find that to be uh, a pretty kind of worrying and telling uh, response. Well, first of all, isn't Obama also um, interested in building capacity? I mean, I, my sense was that this had become sort of a consensus issue at the level of presidential politics. Yeah, he probably is. And I, in, uh, to go to what you were saying earlier, mm-hmm. I am sure that uh, no matter what Obama is running on, mm-hmm. that he would probably end up being sort of more bellicose or more uh, confrontational in the world than how he advertises himself. But that said, there is a clear uh, difference uh, between the two candidates. And I think that's what makes this election so interesting, um, that it's actually a clear choice on something that matters. Uh, yeah. So in many ways, it's a, that's a, it's a, a, good, a, a good and interesting choice to have. Well, it takes a while, of course, also for capacity to, to come online. And as I think you could see in that uh, that McCain comment you were just talking about, um, I think sort of, you know, the Iraq syndrome, a sort of reluctance to intervene over, overseas is going to, uh, uh, even if McCain wins, I think would may, remain a constraint on his foreign policy making. I think it's actually sort of very hard to figure out how many differences there really would be between uh, an Obama and McCain administration in, in terms of dealing with Iran, because as I say, you know, I'm not sure how seriously any of the campaign rhetoric can be taken. Yes, I mean, they're, yeah, as you as you point out, they're starting from different places, and we can, you know, you might prefer the starting place of one, and I might prefer the starting place of another, but I'm just not sure, given you know the the, the pressures of office, um, how different the outcome is going to be. Well, I think that. I'm, I'm fully confident that under our coming McCain presidency that uh, if Iran ever gets anywhere close to building a nuclear weapon, and I'm not altogether convinced that they are, but if they were remotely close, uh, someone would take that out, and, uh, and uh, whether that's the uh, United States or Israel, but that it would have completely McCain's blessing. I mean, his, now, did you just his... refer to our coming McCain presidency? <laughs> it's more fun to imagine it that way for book sales, if nothing yeah, else. Yeah, right, right. Uh, no, I mean, he's, I think he has a chance. My predictions are almost always wrong. I predicted Rudolph Giuliani would be our, uh, 
or a candidate right now, although I did predict uh, Obama early. Um, I think it's a bad year for Republicans. And so he's, McCain is going to have to really paint Obama in a corner on uh, foreign policy, which, you know, that's what he's going to try to do. And uh, the, the real cynic in me thinks that if, if there's some kind of attack on U.S. soil or some kind of just large foreign policy conflagration, that people will run to the guy uh, with experience and, you know, the, the illusion or whatever, the, 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 uh, the appearance of toughness. Uh, I think that's McCain's basic uh, only chance in there. But um, pursuant to your uh, you know original cover story enthusiasm for him, he still maintains this pretty remarkable hold on independence, on uh, on you know centrist leaning Democrats, and still on the media, which is a, a non insignificant uh, thing. And it'll be really interesting to see whether six months of a uh, general election campaign of hammering home on various things, whether he's going to be able to maintain that support. If he somehow is able to, to turn that trick, uh, then he still has a shot. I just think that that uh, support is going to erode. And very importantly, um, that he's got a problem on his uh, GOP base uh, that uh, is – it's not going to be easy to hold up, um, you know. Uh, and we can talk a little bit there about, uh, you know, the Bob Barr, Ron Paul uh, uh, terriers nipping at his heels. Uh, I mean, and that's not the only wing of the conservative moment at this point that uh, is uh, is sort of uh, turning yeah. in on itself. I mean, we have a, a coalition here is cracking up. And what's your analysis, being uh, you know, uh, twelve times more conservative than I'll ever imagine being, of uh, people who feel sort of restive? And uh, and don't like McCain for one reason or another, or just feel like it's the it's time for Republicans to lose. What kind of problem does he have? Yeah. Well, first let me just based on something you were you were saying earlier. I mean, I think the only reason Republicans are are in the hunt at all in this presidential race is that is that uh, McCain does better in the polls than a sort of generic Republican, and that Obama uh, does worse than a generic Democrat. Clinton does uh, would have as well. Um, uh, and it makes you wonder, though, how stable that situation is, um, or whether there'll be more sort of partisan sorting, in which case it's pretty bad news for the Republicans. Um, I tend to think that, that McCain's base problem is a little bit exaggerated. Um, I think we should bracket off the libertarians, um, because their appeal is, is not... You know, not entirely to the base. It's also, you know, there's a component of it that's that's that tends to be more democratic leaning, and so it's a little bit more unpredictable that way. I would think that the only element of the base that um, uh, that is really worrisome for McCain that won't come home at some point is uh, single-issue anti-immigration voters. Um, and I'm not sure how many of those there are. I mean, I don't mean to say that just to, to sort of minimize numbers. I mean, I just ge- genuinely think it is hard to gauge how many of those folks there are. Well, um, they certainly didn't give much juice to Tom Tacredo or Duncan Hunter. I mean, I think everyone's been talking about this this sort of uh, chimerical, and I'm mispronouncing that too, uh, uh, anti-immigration single-issue voter. I'm not sure that there's much evidence that they really exist or they vote based on that. Um, I just I haven't seen a whole lot of evidence about it. Yeah, I mean, I think you could make the argument, actually, that a relatively, so to speak, liberal position on immigration helped McCain win the nomination because he effectively clinched the nomination in Florida, um, where he and Romney split um, white uh, Republican primary voters, and he beat Romney five to one among Hispanic voters. And um, you know, pretty clearly, I think, the uh, immigration issue was one of the reasons for that. Um, so in a way, you know, it actually sort of handed the nomination to him. Yeah, well, he, it almost sunk his candidacy totally uh, as well. Yeah, no, I, yeah, of course, that's that's right. But, you know, um, uh, there have been a, st- a string of, uh, of election results which suggest that even though, there, although there may be some power to immigration restrictionism, there's not much power behind single-issue immigration restrictionism. Um, you know, I mean, we saw that in some of the Arizona races in 2006 for the House, for example. Um, so but that, you, you think- know, I, I think the, the question isn't so much how much of the Republican base is going to be out there for McCain. If the Republican base was willing to turn out for Republicans in 2006, it seems to me they're going to be willing to turn out for Republicans in, in 2008 as well. Um, the question is, does the effort to solidify that base keep McCain from appealing to independence in the numbers that he needs to. Does it either waste time that he could be appealing to independence, or does it actively 
require him to do things that alienate them. Yeah, I mean, I think that that, that is his uh, fundamental paradox going forward, is that, I mean, you mentioned uh, support among uh, uh, Im immigrants or uh, Latinos, I forget which, in Florida, but, you know, in, in his three early primary victories that basically sewed up the nomination for him, New Hampshire, South Carolina, and Florida, uh, you know, he never won even a plurality of, of people who described themselves primarily as Republicans. You know, it was yeah. like a and 35, he, and he, 35. He got, he tended to lose the people who described themselves, described themselves as very conservative, although he did, he did all right among yeah. somewhat conservatives. And, uh, and, you know, you look at the, at who was actually voting for him and it's remarkable. It's independents, it's Democrats, it's people who describe themselves as angry at George W. Bush. Yeah. And it's, uh, and it's people who don't like the war. Um, yeah, that was and, that was one amazing result. In, uh, I mean, I mean, and he was stomping Ron Paul on uh, some of those, uh, uh, you know, what you thought would be a protest vote, and so he clearly needs to keep that group of people, uh, you know, in line to have any shot at all in a bad year for Republicans. And yet he's got to keep the base. What gestures can he do to keep the base? And don't you think that there's also a little bit of a slippage? Uh, possible or probable among Christian conservatives. I mean, he did call those guys agents of intolerance, and no matter how much sucking up he's done, yeah. you know, especially since 2004, there are people who just won't forgive him. Well, you know, actually, the agents of intolerance thing is, uh, depending on your perspective, either less or more disturbing. Um, I actually think it's sort of, you know, um, I think it's a misunderstood speech, because back, <laughs> this was, of course, in 2000. I think it was in Virginia Beach that he gave yeah. that speech. And what's really strange about it is that he actually praises Christian conservatives for much of the speech. He singles out Robertson and Falwell as agents of intolerance, but he's actually promoting people like Gary Bauer, who had, who had recently endorsed him. And uh, the only distinction that you could draw at the time between them was that the people he was, uh, the good Christian conservatives were ones who were supporting him, and the bad, dishonorable, evil Christian conservatives were the ones who were uh, opposing him and supporting George W. Bush. Well, at the time, too, let's, uh, let's draw a distinction. Uh, yeah. You know, compassionate conservatism was seen as let's bring in, you know, sort of the little platoons of the church into areas of, uh, of life uh, in charities and things like that. It was seen, you know, both compassionate conservatism and national greatness conservatism were explicit uh, uh, repudiations of libertarian conservatism. I mean, by name. They were saying, you know, the libertarian thing has gone too far. Uh, we need to get beyond Goldwater. We need to get beyond yeah. hand on government. Uh, and so the, and it was well understood, there was these fights between like Marvin Olasky and, uh, and uh, uh, William Crystal and stuff, where compassionate conservatism was sort of the Christian ideal and national greatness was about the state. It was a, a moral, uh, or moralizing based on sort of the secular state, uh, which is uh, so there was yeah. some tension uh, built into the whole project between uh, McCain and the Christian right, which he, you know, famously described as neither on a couple of occasions. Well, but, every uh, every attempted innovation on the right, um, from Buchanan to Bush to McCain, has been a a response to the perceived weakness of the anti-statist um, elements of the conservative coalition. I, mean, I think one really interesting thing, and I think. Uh, it's sort of accelerated over the last few years, but I think it's been present for quite some time now, is that both parties have been downplaying or turning away from their libertarian aspects and, uh, and, um, and really sort of putting more emphasis for political reasons on their anti-libertarian aspects. And I think you can, you can make a pretty strong case that the Democrats have been uh, uh, downplaying their social liberalism. They certainly did, I think, in the 06 elections. And that uh, Republicans have been running away from sort of the Gingrichite, uh, uh, anti-statist elements um, of, of their message. And at the same time, we're in a period in Washington, especially where you have this this feeling of a, of a Reagan coalition that's exhausted, and people are trying to you know uh, join one of the uh, pillars once and for all and point the finger of blame at others. And you hear a lot of people, and even McCain on some time, uh, some. Uh, 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 occasions will say, you know, the Republican Party has lost its way. We've become a big government party. Um, it's interesting. I think you see more people suddenly claiming they're inner libertarian than you did, uh, you know, certainly three or four years ago. Uh, and uh, it'll be interesting to see how that plays out. But I think it's no accident at all that, uh, you know, this year and last year, 
uh, the sort of uh, the split off group from the conservative coalition have been libertarians. I mean, libertarians basically been taking it on the chin for a while now. I think it was a uh, it was a man named Ramesh Panuru who said, uh, like, you know, the limited government revolution aspect of the Gingrich revolution lasted about nine months. <laughs> yeah, and, uh, that's right. That's, that was the big government cutting uh, binge, which of course didn't really cut all that much even uh, even then, although it's depicted in hindsight sometimes as though it was some sort of anarchist riot. But that's a that is a potent grounding, in my analysis at least, uh, uh, something that uh, you know conservatives can feel about themselves. Yes, this is a, a system of principles that we think make the world and the country a better place, a freer place, a more dynamic place, and it's really nowhere to be seen too much in the modern Republican coalition. Uh, although I must say, as someone who just wrote a book that's pretty critical about McCain, uh, that McCain, uh, starting around South Carolina, uh, he made some noises uh, drawing parallels or like connections between limited government and like what Americans can do with their sort of freedom and the, the genius of liberty that he almost has never done in his political career. I think it's an, it's an interesting response to what I think is the fact that Obama and Democrats this year have vaulted to the significant economic left of even where John Kerry was in 2004. Oh, absolutely. Much more hostile to trade, uh, just much more sort of openly uh, talking about the uh, vanishing middle class and and uh, and their own malefactors of great wealth and Wall Street is uh, is screwing over Main Street. And more and more problems. ambitious on uh, government takeover of health care, right? Um, uh, even on taxes. Uh, I mean, they you know Kerry was want, was willing to uh, undo the Bush tax cuts as Obama is, but uh, Obama's also mused about a uh, tax based solution to uh, Social Security's uh, fiscal problems. So, so um, let me let me ask yeah. you this: Who does uh, who does McCain need to name as vice president if you believe that vice presidency matters to any uh, degree in an election, which I think is under some dispute? But uh, in order, like, what should be his thinking in picking a uh, vice president from your point of view? Yeah. Uh, well, I guess I would say um, if I was trying to think through sort of what the ideal McCain vice presidential pick would be, it would be. I guess the five characteristics would be um, pro-life, uh, acceptable to conservatives, uh, reinforcing McCain's image as a as a straight-talking reformer, um, uh, can actually be president, and then fifth, um, wouldn't hurt if uh, they were from a, a crucial swing state. Um, the trouble is, I. It's hard to come up with somebody who who meets all of these criteria. Yeah. Um, and I think, I mean, my own sort of, you know, to the extent I have to think this stuff through, uh, my own ideas as to who that person should be are, are, are stunningly conventional. I think, actually, uh, Mitt Romney uh, makes a, a decent amount of sense. Really? Um, well, for one thing, and I think this is, people under don't appreciate this, uh, uh, enough. If you look at the exit polls from the Michigan primary, it does appear that Romney benefited from a certain kind of uh, quasi home state advantage, yeah. um, which suggests that it would be worth at least a few points in the general election in a state that seems to be up for grabs this year. Uh, and then, you know, I think he could he could talk about some of these economic issues um, uh, with a little bit more. Um, uh, uh, fluency than McCain. He'd be perfect. Very he'd, be, he'd, be accept, he'd be acceptable to conservatives. Um, but uh, not be to Christian conservatives. But not I to think, the you know, I mean, that's, I, I, I think that, um, that this is the Mormon factor, uh, which, which would have put a real question mark over his nomination uh, for president, I think will be less of a problem if he's the vice presidential nominee. And also, I mean, you know, if you were the vice president, if you were to run for president again from that position, I, I think it would be a much diminished factor at that point. It would be sort of inoculated through um, familiarity. What do you um, think? Oh, about and then secondly, I guess, Palenti. I mean, I, I said it was co totally conventional, but uh, I mean, I think the governor of Minnesota uh, makes a certain amount of sense as well. What do you think about uh, it's the governor of Alaska, right, Sarah Jane Palin? Sarah Palin? Yeah. Um, you know, she's, uh, she seems... Um, Impressive in in some ways, but I just I just think for a lot of reasons, not least the the small children, the, the fact that she just gave birth. I'm not sure how eager she would be. Does that just creep you out or what? To <laughs> I don't know how, how eager she would be um, to uh, to uh, run that gauntlet. And she's also, Alaska's safe Republican uh, safe Republican state. 
at least I mean, in the presidential level, a, although um, uh, the House and Senate seat uh, might be lost for the Republicans this fall. Right. Um, uh, do you see any future at all in McCain's momentary gambit of this week to go after uh, disgruntled Hillary voters? Well, um, I, I do think that the um, uh, you know the white working class voters are, uh, and to a lesser extent, Hispanic working class voters are uh, the, the, the groups that um, both candidates are going to be going after. And that would have been the case even if Hillary hadn't been running, and even if Hillary hadn't run the kind of campaign she had. They're just, I mean, they're just the biggest swing group. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think that's going to continue. I don't, I don't know. I don't think that sort of, um, you know, your sort of core Clinton supporter, uh, you know, um, uh, a white woman in her her fifties um, who um, thinks of herself as a feminist, that is not going to be a real up for grabs constituency. That yeah. would not be uh, something I would spend a lot of time um, um, trying to get if I were McCain. But a lot of the uh, union uh, uh, members. Um, uh, non-college educated or some college educated uh, voters, absolutely that's going to be the battleground. And to return to what we were saying earlier, I mean, I think one of the interesting things and one of the things that heightens the dilemma for voters like you is that in general this is a an anti-libertarian swing vote. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's a uh, I, as I said, I don't belong to any political party and I root against all of them actively uh, whenever I have an opportunity to uh, but it is an interesting uh, time to figure out if you are uh, libertarian or just, you know, have a, a general bad attitude of uh, who to vote for. I mean, I think I run into a lot of people uh, who are, you know, lining behind uh, Bob Barr uh, early. And I think he provides an interesting challenge because he's a conservative. I mean, he's a, a social conservative who has, you know, recently – uh, learned how to, you know, get by talking in front of a bunch of libertarians about, you know, states' rights on those issues that he disagrees with them about, uh, and, you know, uh, he's your Mitt Romney. Yeah, perhaps. Um, although, you know, to be fair to him, it's not like he uh, uh, carpet bagged over to the party, uh, you know, a day and a half ago. He, after he lost uh, for Congress in 2002, uh, he joined the ACLU right away, which is a pretty uh, interesting move, and started working against the Patriot Act. And I think he joined the Libertarian Party, you know, by 2004 or five or something like that. So he has been kind of active in there, and he has a, a pretty comprehensible conversion story. Of you know he just you know he was scared straight or something like that, but he provides a very specific challenge. I mean, early polling and you know take it for what it is suggests that he might get eight percent eight percent in a place like Georgia or six percent in North Carolina, and those are states that McCain doesn't need to be wasting his time in. And Bob Barr could theoretically force McCain to try to campaign in those states, which is enough to you know divert him. Uh, people forget I covered the uh, Ralph Nader. Uh, uh, campaign in 2000, which was a, a pretty interesting hoot. And, you know, people want to always talk about Florida. And sure, Florida is where all the action happened. But Nader was forcing, you know, uh, uh, Al Gore to campaign in Oregon a few days before the election. And, you know, a Democrat should not be mm -hmm. having to compete for Oregon in October of an election year. And even in California, where uh, George W. Bush was uh, campaigning pretty strongly. Uh, I think Barr could do that to him in the Southeast, uh, which... Mike well, when you, when you factor in in Georgia and North Carolina, you have the combination of probably increased black turnout um, right. for the first African American presidential candidate, and yeah. um, a, a bar siphoning votes from uh, from McCain. Yeah, it could absolutely be um, uh, be something that tied him down. One question though: Do those polls give us give us any indication of where that vote is coming from? I don't know. I, I, I don't think that they do right now. Uh, I mean, you'd said earlier that you thought there'd be a, a pretty decent size of, uh, of sort of Democrats or independents or just, you know, people with bones through their noses coming over to, uh, to the Libertarian Party at any given point. Um, I'm not so sure with uh, Bob Barr and the uh, vice president, uh, uh, you know, Wayne Allen Root, who I'm sure you're intimately aware of, um, these guys are, are not necessarily the libertarian wing of the Libertarian Party. They I, have identified as Republican for most of their lives. Yeah. And they were even, you know, uh, sort of traditional Republicans in certain ways. So I think that at least... Well, and in a year of liberal enthusiasm for the Democratic ticket, you know, some of the bleeding there should be, should be stopped, I suppose. 
Yeah, I mean, they'll have a certain discipline that Republicans had in 2000. I mean, once the enemy has the uh, keys for eight years, uh, lo and behold, uh, you're not going to be so tempted to go the other way. And Nader, let's uh, not forget, I mean, he got 2.7%, I think, of the vote. And it would have been a lot more, closer to 5%, I think, because all the polling had it towards around 5%, if the election itself hadn't been so close. A lot of uh, you know, older progressives you know, uh, went back to Gore at the last minute because they're scared, uh, and rightly so, of George W. Bush. Uh, and I just wonder if, uh, you know, I- is there a great proposition left for a libertarian Republican within the Republican Party? I mean, what, what are you guys offering uh, a libertarian uh, Republican at this point? Well, I suppose, uh, you know, we're offering, uh, uh, or they are offering... Uh, <laughs> it's you. Well, I, I don't have anything to offer anybody, uh, I'm afraid. But uh, um, no, I think I think uh, what uh, what Republicans offer uh, libertarians is pretty much you know as has always been offered, you know, free trade, low taxes, um, less regulation, and uh, when it comes to uh, spending. Um, under McCain, I think there's a chance of a renewal of the idea of spending restraint. Um, and of course, you know, that comes with pretty much all of the traditional downsides um, that uh, Republicans uh, have uh, to give libertarians as well. What, uh, let's, uh, let's uh, sketch out a, uh, what might be a nightmare scenario to you, uh, and it might be uh, very interesting to me, or at least interesting to watch, a la a train wreck. So uh, we assume that there's going to be a wipeout in the Congress. You know, maybe there'll be a filibuster uh, uh, ability among Republicans. But no matter what, they're going to lose ground in the Senate and the Congress, I think, barring some weird incident. Uh, if McCain loses, and especially if he loses big, which is also possible, I don't, I don't sure. call it probable, um, so it's basically a Republican wipeout right. in November. What happens to the Republican Big Tent? How does it reassemble itself? Uh, you know, what kind of purging or, or non-purging? And you know, and let's say that uh, Bob Barr swings a state uh, and makes it worse. Uh, what happens to the defecting libertarians? Are they rounded up and shot, or are they <laughs> like you know, uh, we should have listened to you? Um, you know, what happens in your analysis to uh, the Republican Party and, and the uh, Grand Reagan Coalition? Uh, there's, a, there's a free for all. Um, I think that the most likely outcome, even under those under scenario where, you know, you could let's let uh, you know where you, let's say you could even argue that say a libertarian cost the Republicans the presidency. I still think that the net effect would be more um, that the Republicans would move in a less libertarian direction on economic stuff, not that they would move left on uh, the social issues. Um, I just don't think. I mean, I, I think both in terms of you know the, the relative strength of uh, of you know, the elements of the party, and also just looking at the map and who where the votes can be gotten. Um, I think that's probably just where where things would go. I mean, you could make a case that um, libertarian candidates cost the Republicans uh, quite a few Senate seats over the last decade in Washington State, in Nevada, uh, in Montana. Um, but the effect of that has not been to make the Republican Party a more libertarian party. And the reason is that, um, y- you know, maybe, you, I mean, it, it may be that you could claim back some of that 2% that defected uh, to, the, to a third party, but the price of what you'd have to do to get them back would cost you too much support elsewhere. I mean, that is, you know, I, look, I think, the, you know, if you look at the, uh, the, the survey that... Um, uh, David Boas, or the, the papers that David Boas and David Kirby have written about the right. libertarian vote and its declining affection for the Republican Party. One of the things that really strikes strikes you is that um, libertarian support for George W. Bush fell dramatically between 2000 and 2004, while obviously Bush's total vote increased. And then yeah. again, between although there's less statistical significance here, between 04 and 06, libertarians actually seemed to go toward the Republican Party while the rest of the electorate was fleeing in droves. As long as libertarians are a minority of the electorate um, that seems to move in the opposite direction of the rest of a majority of the electorate, I just, I just think that there are limited, there's obviously limits to, uh, to how successful they can be. My, uh, my feeling is that people are libertarians who don't care about politics and who would never describe themselves as libertarians. Uh, it's something Nick Gillespie and I have been arguing in various uh, formats 
uh, that the culture is moving in that direction. I think there's no question at this point that America is becoming culturally a much more free, interesting, individualized place where on a day-to-day -day basis, you know, it's not what the government does that dictates what you do, uh, and your relationship with the government is just sort of vague and, and uh, you know, detached and hostile unless you're, uh, you know, on the, on the front lines of uh, some kind of a criminal raid or something like that. Uh, and that the, the things that Americans enjoy in this world of ours, stuff like the Internet, for crying out loud, and what until recently had been cheap airline travel and some other great aspects of modern living – are sort of directly attributable to deregulatory policies and just sort of a freewheeling lifestyle, and that politics is the lagging indicator. We're talking about two 19th century political parties and who are you know, both decreasing mind share and market share, just an incredible clip. I mean, the only uh, growth area in politics right now is decline to state or, uh, or independence of uh, one stripe or another. And I would argue that a lot of those people are just sort of culturally libertarian, and whether they coalesce at any given time behind a certain political party um, is almost beside the point. I mean, it's a, it's easy to marginalize libertarians as a swing vote at any given time. People who you you know describe themselves with that word. I mean, Lord knows I didn't describe myself with that word for years, just because I don't. I never really thought about political philosophy every day when I woke up in the morning, and I wasn't you know brushing my teeth with Austrian economics or anything like that. Um, but I, there, I think there is a sizable block of people. And they are able to be excited on a moment's notice in sort of ad hoc political coalitions. And I think that's part of what happened with the Ron Paul phenomenon, which was certainly a, a curious and active, albeit limited, phenomenon. That's still with us, by the way. I mean, I, do you have any sense what those people are going to do in <laughs> Minneapolis in, uh, in August or September? I, I certainly can't figure it out, but they seem to be brewing up uh, for something. Um, Spontaneous disorder, perhaps. Spontaneous disorder. Uh, we'd all love. We'd all love to see it. Uh, but uh, at some point, I hope, uh, let's say, that politics will reassemble from these sort of tired husks of uh, political parties, and whether that it reassembles. Uh, in the structure of those parties or in the structure of a third party or just separate and beyond from all that, um, you know, I think that there is some low-hanging fruit that Americans who, you know, are still animated by the, uh, the basic creeds of the founders and uh, the basic sort of propositions of liberty here uh, will be attracted to a, a, at a moment's notice that neither party is sort of willing to touch at this point. Well, uh, the trouble with a sort of a moment's notice ad hoc coalitions is that uh, political change often requires more than a moment. And, uh, you true. know, how, how many moments can you uh, keep them interested and keep them engaged? I suppose St. Paul might be a test of that. Um, and uh, what, like how many of uh, these Ron Paul f folks end up supporting Bob Barr? I imagine that there's got to be some sort of, not that I've been following it at all closely, but there's got to be some sort of split among the Paulites. On that, yeah, certainly. Uh, on that front, uh, yeah, and it's it's unclear. I mean, I think it's going to. I think Paul will get a sizable number of write-ins. Whether they'll be counted in any meaningful way is another question. I guess uh, I don't actually know how the uh, electoral law works state by state on that, but uh, uh, his supporters are. Uh, you know, the core of them can be strong enough so that you know they're just going to write him in. They're going to try to cause some mischief. Uh, with the GOP, or or just try to to bend the GOP back in a direction of sort of individualized uh, liberty that it, it doesn't uh, even really try to talk about too much. But going back to our friend McCain yeah. now, um, tell me your uh, tell me your uh, like rosy scenario about how he could make a uh, great president. Uh, well, I think uh, you know one thing is he would be a a very very useful check. On a uh, uh, on a Democratic Congress that is uh, that is more liberal than any previous Democratic Congress, um, I would like to see him uh, appoint uh, one or two more conservative Supreme Court justices. Um, you could maybe there's an outside possibility see some sort of uh, uh, scenario in which he and the Democrats are able to get some sort of worthwhile or mostly worthwhile. Entitlement reform through. Um, oh, I'll, I'll have whatever you're smoking. Uh, <laughs> I, I said it was outside chance uh, <laughs> and uh, merely a scenario. But uh, you know, look, I mean, in some ways, you could see it more easily than you could see, say, George W. Bush or, or Barack Obama. 
Uh, well, I mean, age. George W. Bush, on the, uh, you know, he did talk a game. Uh, I don't think he really put anything together, but he talked a decent game on entitlement reform, at least when he wasn't ramming through a, a new Medicare benefit, which McCain opposed. Uh, we should all remind everybody. Uh, McCain has been pretty consistent against entitlements for a long time and, and in favor of entitlement reform. It's one of the attractive things. I just don't. Like immigration reform, which McCain and Bush were pretty inseparable on for a while, and I presume McCain will after you know a year of uh, living out whatever pandering that he had done uh, last year, will get back on that horse. Um, you know, at some point, uh, yeah, it's interesting, but it can't really pass, uh, and especially with entitlement reform, I just don't see that an emboldened Democrat uh, party is going to say, ah, what we need to do is start privatizing Social Security. This is not really uh, in the cards, I don't think. Well, you uh, wouldn't necessarily have to take the form of, uh, of a Bush-style privatization. There's other things you can do. Um, I think there's also, you're gonna, if you think that that uh, is a, a, a pipe dream, um, I also think that there, are, there is some potential for a deal on tax reform. Um, in this case, because uh, if McCain is president, the Democrats, I think, are still going to have a, a real interest in it because of the alternative minimum tax, which mostly hurts their voters, and uh, giving Republicans a sort of a leverage point of the presidency uh, creates the possible conditions for some sort of tax reform deal as well. Uh, now let's talk about the nightmare scenarios. Sure. <laughs> uh, which, uh, for me, would be uh, one is just a sort of an increasing belligerence or bellicosity in foreign policy. I just don't think that that is the direction that uh, we need to go in. But even on the domestic stuff, I imagine that no matter what happens in a McCain presidency would come up with some big uh, climate change reform that would be probably semi-disastrous in its applications. And I only say that based on his track record. Uh, his McCain has this uh, uh, approach towards reform yeah. Uh, which is very sort of cookie monster, uh, you know, I see problem, must fix problem, which is one reason why uh, editorial oh, that was board, good. Thank you. I'll, Can you uh, I'm here all week. Uh, uh, where uh, it's, uh, uh, I think that's why editorial boards love him is because they have the yeah. exact same approach, basically. It's not right. really thought through. It's not based on any kind of principle about what the limitations of government should be, which I don't think really McCain has a sense of that. Um, so it's those areas of potential cooperation with a Democratic majority yeah. that in many ways uh, kind of worry me the most. Uh, and, well, and but, look, and also, and I think there's a real chance that a McCain presidency could be very much sort of seat of, seat of your pants and uh, that, it, you know, the, the wheels could come off, uh, you know, regularly. Of course, I think that in a way that is also possible with, uh, with Obama, although he's run a very disciplined and effective campaign. Sure. Um, you know, and I guess a sort of, my sort of bigger concern would be uh, that it, you know, even that if he wins, it ends up being sort of just the last gasp of any lingering conservative coalition that that, that it just completely falls apart by uh, by the end, um, both because of his errors of omission and commission. Um, and you know, I'm saying this time you could make a plausible case maybe conservatism might be better off uh, losing. I think in the end, I mean, that's that's not where I come down. Um, but just because of the, just the general exhaustion of conservatism right now. I um, mean, I do think conservatism is going to have to be reinvented uh, to some degree, even if somehow uh, Republicans pull the selection out. And, and what's I think with that, I need to go because my daughter is threatening to barge in here <laughs> at any moment. Uh, uh, maybe she heard the Cookie Monster bit, and uh, I don't know. I, uh, I can understand fully. Well, Ramesh, thank you very much. It's been a, uh, an enlightening hour. And, uh, and uh, you know, I look forward to your next uh, cover story about, uh, you know, uh, why your fellow workers at the National Review have been wrong all along. And, <laughs> and McCain is the one. How many, uh, how many uh, McCain fans are left over there? Or, are people coming around? People are coming around, uh, but uh, the, most people still have more reservations than I do, and I still have a few myself. That's great. Well, uh, thank you very much. This has been Blogging Heads TV. I'm Matt Welch for Amesh Ponaru, and have a pleasant afternoon. Thanks. Bye-bye. welcome.